think the sky is foreboding because we're we're always in foreboding times for one thing, but in Texas in general, any time you leave, you might as well bring your umbrella. But also, um, I love storms with blue bonnets. It's just, it, it's like the two together, or Texas. Uh, I've painted some blue bonnets with tornadoes in them, so, you know, it's, it's just part of, nature is nature, and um, I suppose the tornado would become purple. <laughs>
that they even learn. Anyway, we learned the technique. He taught us a technique of how to actually sculpt in rope. And, and it involved tedious twisting of the rope, inserting a, a cord through, and then letting it spring back. And I'm, I've done that about every inch and a half. So it's, it's, it's one of those um, labor-intensive things that are, that are exciting to do. We only learned abstract. And so for years, I just put that you know, somewhere in the back of my brain. And I'm sitting around in Idaho, actually, and I'm, I'm thinking, I, need a, I want a sculpture that represents my three-dimensional feelings about the same nature that I'm painting. And I was staring at that spool of thread, and uh, rope, excuse me, finally, and I, was, I don't know what that sisal rope was left over from, but I finally picked it up, and I remembered the technique, and I went about trying to find in that technique and pull a human figure out of it. And, it's, and then they have become, for me, maybe the most abstract art that I've ever done because it became a, a wonderful fight to force the figure out. And this was one of my favorites. Um, this one, uh, I can turn it around even. This one I called Lena Tuber. And I called them all tubers because it's like they were something from out of the ground and dark at the bottom and working their, usually working their way up to lightness. But um, Lena was, a, a, was one of my fellow elementary school girl uh, friends who we kind of went, were going through puberty and all that together. And I just watched Lena's, uh, Lena, <laughs> Lena's my dog, Lena is my friend. I watched Lena's figure change into uh, womanhood right before my eyes. And so I dedicated, and I haven't seen her in probably 50 years, but um, this is dedicated kind of to that becoming of womanhood. And that's why it's named Lena, after Lena, my, my school friend. And they became their own. Each of these does develop its own personality. And I've left them headless on purpose because they're more like vessels. I like to think they hold secrets, and um, and rather than a brain, they carry with them all the. There is a brain. The whole thing is a brain, maybe, but they carry secrets from the earth and from from all the things that we experience in the earth. And since this, this is one of them, and this one is moss woman. It became. I really developed into the moss and the green, and and. Um, now she has her own figure too, but um, she just got to be called Moss. She did not get to be called. This other one is is uh, this was actually the very first one. This is the very first of the tubers that I managed to come out with, and um, her structure maybe is a little bit different, uh, but. The feel of it is definitely, definitely started in Idaho, and it's definitely Idaho in it. And she's Earth Mother because she does have all those tributes and, and characteristics. And the snake-like stick that I found to go with her kind of accents another area and another feel of, of a protection or a mother, or also just a little bitty, the things that are um, in nature that we we learn to love and hold. I love the city, and I was in the, I think it's the beginning of the Garden District, where these streets were named after these 
women. And uh, these women were muses, Greek muses, who inspired the arts and the culture in, in Greece. And so I, then I started studying the muses, because I am not a great scholar of Greek mythology, and I'm finding, well, they're daughters of Zeus, they're all female, they were for writers, for poets, for historians, for, for playwrights, musicians, not a single one of the original, and they decided on nine after going back and forth, not a single one of the original nine was dedicated to the visual arts. And I thought about that for a long time, and then I thought, well, maybe I should do a series on muses specifically to the visual arts. And then I began the long process of going, okay, I'm going to limit myself to nine. Who will I choose? And I first started out trying to be traditional. So I started with Alma Mahler, who if there's going to be a muse for anything that involves romance and sexuality, we would have to have Alma. So she was the first, the very first one I chose as a muse. And then I started going along that way and I chose Gala. Gala, who was muse to Salvador Dali, was uh, not the first that I chose, but one of the very early choices. And of all of the muses here, she probably is more characteristics. If we were going to conjure up a muse, what a muse might look like. A beautiful, beautiful woman who was not only sexually beautiful, she really transformed for Dolly his young life. She, she was something like 10 years older than he was. And she continued being a muse to many others well into her 70s. So she was really um, a tribute uh, to muses. But as I went on choosing my muses, I was searching for other things. I didn't want them to be all female any longer. And I didn't want them to just represent that romantic part of the muse. I wanted them to represent much more. And, um, and I, Peggy Guggenheim had to be one of my muses. And she had done so much for um, so many people, I had to decide, and of course I decided that that Jackson Pollock would have to be the one that she was represented as muse to, the one that she never conquered romantically, but whose life she changed so much and completely as far as his art career. And I must say that she also helped so many people during the early years of the Nazi takeover she uh, managed to get, she financed the transport of artists, um, in, including um, um, how many others? Um, Max Ernst was one, um, and, and she ended up marrying Max Ernst. She ended up marrying a lot of people, actually. <laughs> That's another part of her life. Well, she makes her interesting news. But um, she helped a lot, a lot more people purchasing their work when they were considered degenerate artists and um, then eventually making that into the museum in Venice that became her, her formal final mark. When I started this project, I decided two things. Number one, that I didn't want to use a living, uh, a living person, and none of the ones I've talked about so far were. And uh, I just didn't want to deal with um, a lot of different issues if, you, if you're doing a portrait of someone who's living um, and who's, who's in and who's out. So all these were going to be deceased. But I couldn't figure out. I had several I would choose as my last choice and uh, my ninth news. And I got a call from a friend of mine, uh, Bradley Sumrall, curator in New Orleans, and he said, what about James McGee? And I said, James McGee, he's living. But I said, I get it. James McGee is amused to his alter ego, Annabelle Livermore. And it represented a whole other area 
when I'm trying to diversify reasons for muses that had to be in there. So he is, James is alive, very much. And uh, Annabelle, James's sculpture are like mounds and metal and strong sculptural materials. And especially his huge installation that's happening about 100 miles of, outside of El Paso. It's a life's work and it's, it's amazing. But then he, he reached his feminine side and he reached it to such a degree that it's truly the birth of another person. And I've never ever heard him talk about Annabelle with me in the first person. She's so totally an alter ego. He talks totally talks about her as a separate person. And it's a beautiful, a beautiful thing to watch. But the one thing he told me in passing was Annabelle never makes her own openings. But, he said, she always sends me to the dinners. And Dominique de Menil, a fellow Houstonian here, is included in my muses because of the many, many, uh, many people that she supported and helped and inspired. And so I was left with the uh, situation of choosing one, and I chose Max Ernst. And of all the people, um, he was the first, I think, one of the very first ones that, that uh, John and Dominique collected when they were first married in France. And they also commissioned a self-portrait, or not self, excuse me, a portrait of Dominique. And I have a tiny, tiny little stamp of it here, which was an interesting story in itself because I'm not sure that the Damonels were as pleased with it as um, they didn't know what Maybe they didn't know what he was going to do, and maybe he didn't know what he was going to do, but now it's very much hung in the museum and everything is, is well. But uh, God, then I learned a lot about Max Ernst because he was involved. He was involved in a menage a trois with Gala, and he was married to uh, Peggy. So uh, the guy, you know, he got around pretty good. It was a trip to Peru in 1982 that totally changed the way I looked at life, the way I looked at art, and even the way I look at dogs. So um, this dog is just one of the many uh, remnants of that in my mind of that trip, which continues to really inspire and inform everything that I do, that these um, these dogs, these hairless dogs, were running around, and um, they they seem to they seem to have with them special powers. So much so that the kings from the Indian tribes uh, buried them. They're, they were buried with them, and they were thought to have special healing powers. And we have I have been living with these dogs since um, I got my first one in nineteen. And excuse me, I keep saying 19, 2006, and um, and I we have bred them, and and uh, we just keep love being in love with these dogs and sharing them with so many people. This one's name is Lily. This drawing uh, goes back to a little bit of Greek mythology. I was doing, I had the three dogs at that time, so I kept finding three dog combinations of <laughs> things. And I found the three fates that I read up about, and I decided which of my dogs represented uh, each of the three fates. And the trip to Greece last fall, last early or late summer, actually, uh, I began I found some actual pieces done by the Greeks on the three fates. And so I wondered what they would think of me putting mine in the dog. <laughs> but that's okay. But they ended up 
I ended up making the spinner is the one that spins us into life. And this, the three fates, is the story of our life cycle. So Luna, my only girl, is the spinner. She was the one that spins us into being. And then we have, and just uh, immediately I knew that Pluto would be my measurer. Pluto is the one that decides how long, how much rope you get to have, or how many times you get to go through life. He, he determines the length of your life. And then we move on to my, my boy Thor, and who's holding uh, the knife in his hand. When Pluto tells Thor it's time, then Thor cuts, cuts the life. And I'm not sure that's the same way that the Greeks would tell the story, but that's my, my version of the three fates. Bradley gave me a poem, uh, probably the most gut-wrenching poem of his life, because he wrote it about a murder that happened on the streets of in New Orleans in a, in a pizza place, and how and and all about, all about this, and so I read it, and I was so moved by this, and then I didn't know how in the world I was going to put that into a love poem, and he also told me a story about after the hurricane about how uh, a friend of his uh, called him and said there's an injured crow outside on my sidewalk I don't know what to do so he came and he was trying to he's picking up that bird to take it to a bird sanctuary where it did recover after he got it but while he was trying to to gather that injured bird he was circled by uh, crows who were trying to protect their buddy and they didn't understand that he was taking it away uh, to help it and save it and, in, and indeed when he brought it back to put it back where he got it it was fine he was still circled by those crows and they were never ever going to he said he anytime I don't know how recently he's tried to walk in that spot because it's been years ago but I, I don't know whether they would still circle him but they might they never they never forgot and they never gave up their protection and so I took that as, as meaning as meaning to find love in in all the tragedy that happened and all the police I put in the police signs in this drawing and the crows are up there but I also have um, Bradley was also, he doesn't talk about it a lot, but he was also a victim of violence in New Orleans, and he survived. But I have him on the ground and him looking down at himself in this particular drawing as, as the white birds, and also all the other birds. There were, there were three victims from the pizza place, and one of those survived, and so they're also, the two survivors are, are marked. And let the crows forever circle around and, and hopefully that the meaning can come that if we surround each other and help each other, that um, we can, like the crows, can help save each other. And so it's called Weaving a Sanctuary with the Murder of Crows, which may be the longest title I've given to a piece of work ever, but um, I had to get all that in there. <laughs> this is the one remnant in this exhibition of the sculptures of my past that took, oh, 10, 15 years of my life where I did different Catholic figures. I was examining the Catholic Church in, some say it's a love-hate relationship. I'm not sure. I think it was more of a foundation and since then, I've, I've gone on to expand upon my own spirituality. But the Catholicism is always going to be my foundation. And with respect to all the good people in that religion. Um, and there are not, they're not all good. So that's part of the reason I'm not uh, as associated with it. But the nuns were always 
my favorites. Even if they have paddles in their hands, <laughs> they represented something very positive and very good. They gave me my beginning education as well as probably several others who are viewing this or are even producing this film. So um, I wanted her in here to represent many years of my life. And um, I've done one pope, I've done a cardinal, I've done many, many priests, and uh, many, many Catholic martyrs, so uh, all in sculpture. So she needs to be uh, just, she's just, I'm still with them. <laughs> this particular piece was the last one finished. So this is the most recent piece of work I have in this exhibition. It was finished early in 2019. And it's called The Beginning of Time, The End of Time. And it's all the things that went into my blue bonnet painting and all the other things, maybe stated in a more specific way that we have. It's a volcano and there's life coming from it. In this birds escaping it and birds going around it and back to it. In this fish underneath it. And the whole thing is made of also of a, of a backbone. So for me, all of this comes together and makes a continuation of life. It's really about the cycle. It's, it's about the structure of, I made the actual volcano is almost a personage, a structure that breathes out life. And it continues and then it goes into the uh, underground and then it comes back out again.